Good morning, friends, and welcome to Chatham United Methodist Church. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be worshiping with you today. We're glad that you've chosen to be with us during this time. We're going to start an exploration of the book of Ephesians today, and so we're going to spend time talking about what it means to be rooted and grounded in love. So we're glad that you're here. If you're if you're visiting with us uh, for the first time, or maybe this is just the first few times that you've worshiped with us, we really hope that you will leave a comment or that you'll send us a message so that we can get to know you a little bit as you continue to get to know us. We are a community that exists to grow fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, and we invite you to be a part of that mission. Once again, we're grateful that you are here Please leave a comment, talk to your church family uh, as we move through this time together so that we might be reminded that we are deeply, deeply connected to each other. Peace to you all and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Obviously, I'm here at home this week, and I'm just out here this morning enjoying the, the fruits of some hard work that's went on this year and in the past couple of years, enjoying the flowers and, and the sunshine in the outside area. And you see, I was able to enjoy this because 
we did put in the work in order to have the pretty flowers and all. Now, a couple years ago, we wanted to put in a couple, uh, a couple new features, and one of them is this tree. Now, we went and got this tree, and when we got it, it was, it was pretty short. Okay, it was probably shorter than I am. Uh, so we brought it home and we dug this hole, and we prepared the hole and and put fresh dirt in and put fertilizer in it and watered it down real good. And then we put the tree in, packed the dirt in real good, and and, and it was. I mean, we did everything that the nursery said that we should do to make this tree grow good. And you know what? When we first put it in, it looked all right. But after a couple days, it started, the, the, the leaves all lost their color and it started withering a little bit. And we realized we weren't giving it enough water. So we had to get out here and, and start feeding it, giving it water regularly so that it could grow. Because you see, it didn't have deep roots yet. It did, the roots that, that suck up the water and the nourishment, they didn't go real deep into the ground yet. So it wasn't able to get down there and get the good water. So we had to supplement that. Now, the Bible tells us that God wants us to be rooted in God and rooted in the Bible and rooted in Jesus. Now, this is so that we can get our nourishment and grow. And you know what? If we do, we can become the ones that nourish the those around us whether they're friends or whatever. We got a lot of new things going on. Some of us are going, some of you will be going back to school here soon. Some people are, are going back to work or to new jobs or to new offices. Some people are moving to the new areas and you need to have, and you're looking for someone to love you. They're looking for someone to love them. So you know what? We have Jesus that loves us. It's going to help give us the Bible, give us our nourishment, those around us, if you come into contact with someone new, maybe at your school, please go ahead, make a friend. Show them God's love. Help nourish them in God's love. You see, once this tree had good roots and grew, it started producing fruit. We got apples on this tree now. And you know what? That's what God wants us to do, to grow, get stronger in God, and produce fruit for him. So everyone, remember that. And stay in your Bible and show God's love and help nourish each other and stay rooted in God's love. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, we just thank you for Jesus' example, for him loving us enough to help root us in your love. Help us show that love to others and continue to, to make good fruit for you. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Ephesians three thirteen through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. These words inspired by God for the inspiration of the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray for me as I pray for you this morning? Oh God, we pray that you would open our hearts to what it is that you need to say to us today. And may the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. So friends, we are going to be spending several weeks in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians is a letter that was written uh, in the late first century uh, to the churches in the region around the city of Ephesus. This means that the church in that region was made up primarily of Gentile Christians. They were Christians, but they were Gentile, so they were not initially of the Jewish faith like so many of Jesus' earliest followers. They were outsiders uh, to the faith, you could say, and yet they were being welcomed into the family. The circle was widening to include people not thought to be included before. And it all takes place in the city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is an ancient Greek city. It is in what is now the country of Turkey. And I say ancient because it was established. It was built uh, in the 10th century BC. So that means that the city existed some 1,000 years before Jesus even walked on the face uh, of the earth. When the Apostle Paul, uh, who founded the church in Ephesus, arrived on the scene, the region was then a part of the Roman Empire. The Romans had taken over in 129 BC, and the city flourished under Roman rule. It was an attractive place to live and to work. Uh, It was really famous because of a temple. It was called the Temple of Artemis, and it was built in 550 B.C. And the Temple of Artemis uh, is considered to be one of the seven ancient wonders of uh, the ancient world. And at that time, it was the center of of religious practice and kind of cultural practices uh, of the time. And it made Ephesus... Uh, a place to be. All of it now is in ruins. It's a place to simply be explored by tourists. But there is no denying the city's importance in the movement of the Christian church into Asia and into Europe. The Ephesian church was an important church, or really it's an important grouping network uh, of churches. But like all Christian churches under the Roman Empire, it struggled. You know, Rome wasn't kind to Christians. That's actually probably a very, uh, that's really probably a really bad understatement because Rome actually did whatever it could. It took whatever means necessary to banish the movement of Jesus followers across the empire. But despite its many efforts, the Christian community grew in that region. Uh, And the network of churches expanded and it grew stronger. And even after Paul left that region, he and his friends continued to write letters and encourage the church and to correct the church and to dive into problems the churches were having. And in the mid to late first century, the church received this letter. And the letter would have been copied and sent throughout the network of churches. Community leaders would have read it in their weekly gatherings. They would have parsed it, conversed about it, reflected on it, read it again and again and again, memorized it. They would have turned to it for encouragement and guidance and sought to put into practice what was being suggested. Now, one of the things I think I admire about Paul and his followers is that they were idealistic And yet they also understood just how difficult it was for early Christians to live out their faith in the context of the Roman Empire. You know, when you read this letter and think deeply about what they were being asked to embody in the world, it put targets on their back and compelled them uh, to act sacrificially on behalf of their neighbors even their neighbors who weren't Christians, and maybe even their neighbors who were hostile against them, who might be considered their enemy. They knew that their faith expected a lot of them. But because Jesus had changed everything for them, they did it all, and the church flourished, even in places like Ephesus. Some of the big themes that stand out in Ephesians 
relate to identity. The members of the Ephesian church were primarily Gentiles. They were Christians, but they weren't like Paul. They weren't like their founder. They were the adopted ones into the family. And so they struggled with who they were in the family of God. Were they an afterthought in God's plan of salvation? Were they the backup plan of God's salvation? Uh, and what does all of that mean for their identity? Who, who were they in Jesus Christ? You know, and I think this is one of the areas in which Ephesians is really going to meet us where we are because we struggle with identity. We struggle communally with identity. Who are we as a church? You know, who are we? Why do we exist? What is our primary identity as church? And then we struggle a lot individually with identity. Who are we? What are we made for? What is our value and worth apart from what we do or how much money we make or what gifts and talents we have? What is our identity? And, and related to that, what is our purpose? What are we made for? Another big theme in Ephesians is love. The word love appears 14 times in just six chapters. And the first half of the letter, it's all about God's love and what the love of God does for us and in us. The second half of the letter focuses on the action of love that Christians are to have and to give and to live in when it comes to others. And this is what brings me to the portion of scripture chosen for today. It comes from the middle of the letter, so we're starting in some regards in the middle instead of in the beginning. But chapter 3 is this significant transition. Uh, the writer is transitioning from the first half of the letter that's more theological in nature to the second half of the letter that's more practical uh, in nature. The first half of the letter, uh, in the first half of the letter, the churches are being encouraged to remember who they are and just what it is that they need to know deep down, right? They're being reminded of the essentials. This is God's plan from the very beginning. This is who God is fundamentally. So what are the essential things that we are to build the church upon and to build our lives upon? What are the essential beliefs that we hold to about God and about God's work in the world and our place in the world and in God's kingdom? And then the second half of the letter reminds them that if this is what they believe, then they will commit themselves to doing and to living out their beliefs. It's theologically rich, to be sure, but it's just more practical in nature on the, on the back side. Because, you know, Christianity has never been a religion that is primarily about what you know or even what you claim to believe in. It's, it's really a religion or a belief system that is fundamentally lived out in community. One's beliefs are to be lived out in real life. And the Bible shows us what that looks like lived out in community. So what this means is that we can't just tell other people what we believe and go about living lives any way we choose. Perhaps ignoring behaviors that diminish our witness of Christ and our commitment to the church. It's not just telling other people what we believe, so that they can believe it too. Being Christian means that, you, uh, that what you believe is lived so that others might see Jesus alive and living through you. You know, it can be really difficult for us to swallow at times, but every statistic that I have read concerning the witness of the church, right, the perception of the church by those who are outside uh, of the church comes down to our ability to hold these two things in tension. Because the word hypocritical gets thrown around very easily uh, in, in, in those circles. Because trust me, the world is watching the church. Particularly right now, the world is watching. And people will listen to what it is that we have to say if we are truly living it out in our lives, we can say a whole lot of things. We can plaster it all over social media, but if we're not living it, 
then there's no proof that you actually believe what you say that you do. Now, that being said, Christianity isn't a religion built on works righteousness either. It's never just about what we do. And this is because there's something more. There's something more than just a mission statement at the core of our identity. There's a relationship. There's a relationship at the center of everything. There is a God who longs to be in relationship with people so much so that that God went so far as to become like us in order to love us from as close as God could get and then to be loved by us in return. What we believe, what we say we believe, and what we do in response all relates back to this one thing, that God is ultimately love, love embodied for the world. So here's what we are going to explore over the next several weeks. We're going to explore what it means to be rooted and grounded in love, rooted and grounded in the love of God, to be rooted and grounded theologically in love in what we believe and what we hold on to at all times so we're not tossed about by every storm and to be rooted and grounded in the practical nature of love and how we align our lives with what we believe. Paul prays in Ephesians 3, he says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, He may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Now we may hear this voice and and hear Paul say, I pray that you may be strengthened in your inner being. Right? That speaks to us. I hear that when I read this portion because if there's anything that we need right now, it's to be strengthened in our innermost being, right? We're tired, we're exhausted deep down, and we need to be strengthened deep down. And to this I say, yes, Lord, please, right now. But then I think, you know, right now we also need to be reminded of our grounding, of what it is that we are grounded in. Dean talked the past couple of weeks about the storm that blew the disciples around, and you may feel like those disciples being tossed around uh, these past few months. With God, however, we've got a root system. right? With Jesus, we've got a foundation that is grounded in a love that is stronger than anything we can imagine. Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 3, he says, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So here are a couple of images that I want to leave you with this morning as we begin this several-week journey. To, to think about to start thinking about what it means to be rooted and what it means to be grounded in God. So think about a skyscraper. Think about the kind of grounding, right? The kind of foundation at the base of a skyscraper, right? Think about how many stories deep the foundation is so that building can just grow up into the sky. So what's so interesting to me about the architecture of a skyscraper is how the construction of what is above the ground complements what's below the ground as the building rises. So there's this deep, deep foundation. And then on top of this deep foundation, there is this steel frame and curtain walls built upon the foundation that enable the building to grow higher while also... Um, enabling it to withhold the seismic shifts that happen in the ground and, and the wind, resisting the wind that happens in the sky. 
So what this means is the building is meant to flex. It's not a rigid structure, and yet the building grows to heights not known to man uh, until the last couple of centuries. Think about this for a moment. Reflect for a moment about being a Christian, being grounded in the love of God that enables us to rise like a rising skyscraper, to grow, right? Uh, What this kind of grounding, right? What seems like the impossible, the impossible kind of love that we are being called to in the Bible uh, just might seem possible with this kind of grounding. Or think about this image. They say that the roots of trees are so powerful, so strong, that they can actually break stones. And I'm not just talking about the tree roots that break up your sidewalks, but that's kind of it on a small level. But tree roots can split huge stones in half or break giant stones into pieces. The key is that it happens over time. It happens, but it takes time. And those are some strong roots. Now, you might think, right, that between a tree root and a stone, that the stone would win every time. But that's just not the case. With the constant pressure over time, tree roots can win. And, you know, and this makes me think, when I think about love, and I think about the hearts of those that we love, and it makes me think that even the hardest of hearts, with the pressure of genuine love, Genuine love, that's the key, genuine love, over time can be broken open to the love of God. I don't think that there is anything other than true, genuine love that has that kind of power. And Paul prays that we might be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in that kind of power, the most powerful force on earth, and not just in the romantic comedy or the romantic kind of way. Love truly is the most powerful force on earth. It grounds us in God, and it gives us the power to move, right, and to sway in the midst of a storm and yet never lose our footing. And it grounds us in genuine love for our neighbor that over time has the power to open hearts to the love of God. And so this week, I invite you to spend some time reflecting on what it means to be rooted and grounded, right? If you need to take out Ephesians chapter 3 and read these verses again, I really encourage you to do so. Read it like the churches would have then. Read it over and over and over and over again and memorize a verse. Memorize a verse that reminds you that we're to be rooted and grounded in love. And to think what or who in your life helps you to keep grounded in God's love. Right now, who is it and what is it that is helping you to to keep grounded in God's love? Or what is it or who is it that you need in your life right now in order to to keep you grounded in God's love? What helps you to remember who you are and what you were made for? And who and what helps you remember that God's love is working on you too, right? We might be loving another, right, to an open heart, but God continues to love us, to open our hearts wider and more fuller to him each and every day. And it is a powerful, powerful love. Will you pray with me this morning? Oh God, we come to you in uh, the quiet of this moment, and we are just grateful for your presence among us. We're grateful that because of this technology, we can even feel the connection that we have uh, to people all across this community, people that we are committed to in love because of your grace in our lives and the presence of this church community in our lives. And we're so grateful for letters like Ephesians that remind us to stay grounded and rooted in love 
and in particular in your love. Help us to examine our hearts this week, to, to examine our hearts, to look inside and see what it is that we have rooted ourselves in, what it is that we are trusting in. And if we discover that we are not rooted and grounded in your love, then help us to put down deep roots into your love. Help us to move our allegiance away from the things of the world that are just so attractive and enjoyable and fun uh, and root us deeply into you and in your grace and in your love because we know that being rooted and grounded in you gives us the ability to love others and it gives us the ability to stay rooted deeply in you even when we are tossed about in the storms. And there's no denying that we have been in a storm. But we are so grateful that our roots are in you. And uh, we just pray, oh God, for our community, our church, that we might examine if our roots are really grounded in your love or in something else. And we want to be grounded in you and in your love. And so we pray for our community. We pray for those in our community that need reminded just how loved they are right now. We pray for our friends that are grieving. We pray for our friends that are lonely, that are feeling disconnected. We pray for our friends that are suffering, who are going through treatments, who are recovering from surgeries. Uh, no matter what it is they're feeling, we pray that you would just simply surround them with your goodness and your love. And may you guide us and direct us in the way that you need us to go. We have a whole lot of ideas of the way that we want to go. But we want to go in the way that roots us and grounds us in you. And we ask all of this in the name of your precious son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. your heart, what stirs your soul, what matters come to mind, the cares you keep, the thoughts you think, it's not all wasted time. Joy still comes in the morning, hope still walks with the hurting, you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming, there's still good news worth repeating, so lift your head and keep singing. our way from home. A father finds the child inside, left for growing old. Wake, awake, awake my soul. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. Let everything, let everything, let everything praise. Joy 
still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Hey friends, before you go, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sneak peek uh, of all of the preparations that have been made for Back to School Blessings Day. We are going to be giving away tonight, tomorrow, and Tuesday night uh, all of the supplies uh, that have been organized and purchased and readied uh, to be put into the hands of school children all across our Chatham area. And you should be proud of your outreach team and uh, the mission team who have coordinated uh, these events. Uh, it has been done out of great love, and I tell you, hours and hours and hours of time. And you can see behind me uh, some of that uh, organizational structure, and these backpacks are readied uh, for children. And so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a look. I know that a lot of you are going to be coming over the next few nights to help with this, but I just wanted to share in your excitement as we truly get to be used uh, by God in a wonderful way just this week. And it's, uh, and it's all been done during this uh, time of COVID and it is going to bless students. And so friends, we are just thrilled that you've joined us today. Will you pray for your church? Will you pray for what's to take place here at your church over the next few days? Uh, and will you pray that we will truly be the church God has called us to be in this time and in every time? Go in the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of Jesus Christ. And may the peace of God simply reign in your heart and your life. Amen. Let us go in peace.